Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Kambiz Ranawardi, board member for Columbia, D.C., and a graduate School of Engineering and Applied Science. We are very privileged to have Edmund Phelps, McVicker, Professor Emeritus of Political Economy and Director of the Center on Capitalism and Society at Columbia University to talk to us about uh, his uh, latest book, My Journeys in Economic Theory. And this would be in conversation with uh, Dr. Colin Becker, entrepreneur and visiting lecturer at the Cornwall Business School at the University of Falmouth. Uh, please uh, allow me to really briefly introduce our uh, storied uh, panelists. Uh, I, I do encourage everyone to check our website for uh, for full additional details. Edmund Phelps, as most of you know, uh, is the winner of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 2006. He attended public schools, earned his BA from Amherst, got his PhD at Yale in 1959. After a stint at Rand, he held positions at Yale and its uh, Cowles Foundation, also a professorship at Penn, and finally at Columbia in 1971. He has written several books on growth, unemployment theory, recessions, stagnations, inclusion, uh, rewarding work, dynamism, indigenous innovations, and the good economy. His work can be seen as a lifelong project to put people as we know them into economic theory. And our host, uh, uh, Dr. Colin Becker, is a multi-award winning serial entrepreneur, building businesses aligned with sustainable development goals. Their current projects, among their current projects, uh, uh, are the uh, co-authoring a comparative history of varieties of capitalism in the U.S. and Northern Europe from 1900 to the present, with uh, Volker Bergan, set to Professor Meredith of History at Columbia. So without further ado, um, Colleen, I send it to you. Thank you so much, Kambiz. And thanks as well to Professor Phelps for the wonderful opportunity to closely read My Journeys in Economic Theory, which was a fascinating book, especially for me as an entrepreneur, an artist, and academic and historian. I um, absolutely enjoyed reading all of the wonderful ideas he has set out here about um, the power of innovation and the power of creativity and ways in which this can be harnessed for economic growth. I thoroughly enjoyed collaborating with his team on, um, on this presentation. And um, without further ado, I believe Professor Phelps has a fantastic slideshow he would like to share with us. Yes. It's an honor to talk here about my memoirs. Writing them was a bit bold since only about a half a dozen economists have done that. But I had experiences and thoughts I wanted to share with others. The book, My Journeys in Economic Theory, tells the story of the main experiences in my career as an economic theorist, the fierce opponents, the competing claimants, the teacher who underestimated me, the great figures I was fortunate to be close to. More important, it's a story of my part in reshaping some basic elements of economic theory over the past six decades. The journeys in the title refer mainly to two journeys, quite different experiences. The first was the excitement I drew from my early work in the 60s to put the macroeconomics of Keynes and Hicks onto a microeconomic foundation. The key step was to introduce firms' expectations of other firms' wage changes into the theory of the way of wage setting and price setting too. That led to the notion of an equilibrium path, the path along which expectations of, of the change of money wage levels and price levels are borne out, and the notion of disequilibrium, in which expectations are not borne out. Uh, the ensuing 1969 conference 
uh, that I organized at Penn and the 1970 conference volume published by W.W. W. Norton were the high points of my career for quite a while. Earlier in the 60s, I modeled the effect of the public debt on the path of the nation's capital stock, work that had a mixed reception. And there was another paper I wrote, became rather well known or notorious, uh, the golden rule of accumulation. In the 1970s and 80s and 90s, I branched out from standard economics, such as unemployment and public finance, to work on new subjects, statistical discrimination, economic justice with John Rawls when he and I were out at Stanford, and the benefits of altruism with Thomas Nagel when he and I were literally neighbors in Manhattan. There was also my work with Jean-Paul Fitoussi on the effects overseas of a fiscal stimulus at home, and my work with Kenneth Arrow on the economic gains present in an economy under capitalism that are not found in an economy under socialism. And much later in the 90s, I worked with Hyuntek Hoon of Singapore and Gilfi Zewega of Iceland, both former students of mine, to write Structural Slumps. That book estimated the extent to which it is shifts in the natural rate itself that are often the cause of shifts in the unemployment rate. A little later, I wrote another book, Rewarding Work, a book that makes a new case for lifting the wages of the less advantaged. The second of the two journeys that I referred to was, or is, my later work. With the new century, I wanted, I felt the need for a new direction. I became aware that I had been conceiving new elements with which to support or enrich the theories of others, typically Keynes, Keynes's theories, not conceiving and not conceiving a basic theory of my own. Fortunately, a new perspective on the economies of a modern society came to my mind. And over the next two decades, I was able to build a radically new theory of my own. I came to reject the neoclassical view of innovation, the view adopted in both Schumpeter's brilliant 1912 book and Robert Solow's well-known 1956 growth model. In that view they took, the emergence of new methods and new goods in the West, mostly in a half dozen lead economies, was exogenous to those nations' economies. They rose in that view, they rose from discoveries of scientists and navigators. But with what, I wondered, could that theory be replaced. I thought it was wrong, but it took some time to figure out how it might be replaced. In writing the my 2013 book, Mass Flourishing, I came to believe that in the hundred years of unprecedented economic growth in the West, the widespread innovation in the lead nations was not exogenous for the most part. It was largely fueled by people from the grassroots of those nations. Ordinary people, as I like to say, people working in the economy, 
people in a variety of companies who might sometimes conceive a better way to produce something or even new things to produce. I felt the deep involvement of many people using their creativity to conceive new methods for new products. It was a demonstration of widespread creativity in a whole society. Few societies were capable of this, of course. Those few possess what I call a kind of dynamism. In my view, this dynamism found in some Western societies derive from their embrace of modern values. The few economies generating high rates of innovation were in nations having those values. That was my theory. Now, would the data support that theory of mine? The theory that the extraordinary innovation in the West was mainly ind indigenous to the people working in the nation's businesses, not exogenous as supposed by the neoclassical theorists from Schumpeter to Solo and beyond? The answer was yes. The data was with me or were with me. In Dynamism, the 2020 book of mine and my team, my research team, statistical tests performed by Raicho Bojilov and by Gilfi Zuega confirmed the importance of such values. This theory of innovation has been a huge departure from the prevailing perspective on work. My fascination with the experience of work in many jobs, not all of course, dates back to my first monograph, Inflation Policy and Unemployment Theory, another Norton book published in 1972, written in my year out at Stanford. That book observed that one's jobs brings, besides the wage, feelings of self-respect, esteem in the community, the sense of economic independence, and various job satisfactions. That was page 114 of that, you know, of that book, if you want to look it up. Mass flourishing, however, pointed to a further experience in the labor force. The people participating at one time or another in the widespread innovative projects were using their creativity to make new things. These people were meeting challenges, finding self-expression, and enjoying personal growth in the process. These people were flourishing. In exercising their creativity, these people could have highly rewarding lives. That was my view, my thesis. Now, in America and France and Britain to a, to a degree, we have witnessed the, the consequences of the narrowed innovation over the past five decades. While much of the high tech innovating has continued and even picked up steam uh, in the US. There has been a severe contraction of economic growth as a result of this narrowing of innovation growth as measured in terms of total factor productivity. Hence, wages have slowed to a, to a snail's pace. Working life has dulled. And, and perhaps not surprisingly, social tensions have risen, bringing violence in the streets and in America, even in children's schools. 
The inference drawn in mass flourishing and also dynamism is that, and I quote, to regain the high desire to innovate, it will be important to cultivate the, po the positive values that were so fruitful for nearly a century. I sense now that the importance of values is greater than I had surmised. There may be a kind of multiplier at work. Contractions in the supply of modern values decreases the amount of economic growth supply supplied and a demoralizing uh, lo loss of growth may induce a further loss of values and hence a further slowdown. A wide ranging change in the books studied in high school may be essential to getting out of this morass. It might help to, it might help to re reintroduce music and art into high school, high schools and middle school curriculums. In addressing this problem, the government will want to take any and all measures that can be expected to restore the values that sparked human effort to create new methods and new things in the past. Stripping away overreaching regulations would likely be a huge help to many would-be innovators. Severing the close ties between powerful corporations and the government, both legislative and executive branches would also be helpful, I dare say. So would ending badly aimed spending. Good spending is okay. A point often made about the way business is organized in Germany may also apply to the conduct of business in France and some other countries. A hierarchical character of business in the workplace impedes transmission of any new ideas up the ladder to the managers. I would add that it might raise the morale of workers and thus encourage their innovativeness if the government were to subsidize low wage employment. Thus raising wage, their, thus raising their wage rates and raising morale. At the very least, countries must continue to reject adoption of the universal basic income, which is going in the wrong direction, just throwing money at people. In general, governments ought not to adopt, adopt pro programs that quote draw or keep many people and their children away from work, which is away from work, which is for most people, the only available avenue for personal fulfillment and indeed for involvement in the world. As I said uh, in uh, Dynamism. Now, I wanna go beyond growth a little bit and then I'll turn over the uh, the microphone. Uh, and I want to go beyond growth. In my memoirs, my journeys in economic theory, I pointed out that doing things, doing some things in the economy at any rate, may be off, may often be rewarding, regardless of how little commercial value those things may have. In the memoirs subsection. I, looking back, I wrote, quote, economics ought to explore the manifold rewards of work, the personal growth that comes from participating alongside others, the satisfaction of, of succeeding at something, the excitement of creating something, and the self-discovery that comes from overcoming obstacles, engaging in one's work taking initiative, venturing into the unknown, and thrilling to the new. <coughs> Quoting more, I would point out that these experiences of work are not simply key inputs 
to indigenous innovation in a nation's economy and thus a source of its economic growth. They are, these experiences are goods in themselves and invaluable. It is imaginable that an economy may develop in which the sophisticated firm regularly offers full-time employees working in the office a space in which to use their imagination to conceive new things, much as a firm might offer a recreation room to practice sports. An orientation toward creativity would be common and even widespread. The provision of this facility to employees would be a part of their benefits from work. We economists have not recognized that for several decades, people, people in the West at least, have wanted to lead rich lives. They need an economy in which jobs are interesting, engaging, and occasionally fun too. A good life, a life of richness as some human humanists call it, means for one thing, an occasional sense of succeeding, the feeling of prospering when your ship comes in or you gain recognition. The good life also means a kind of flourishing, using one's imagination, exercising creativity, journeying into the unknown and acting on the world. A good economy holds out expectations of a good life, but a good life in much of society is more and more an unmet need these days seven or eight decades or so. I can also envision an economy that is in large part a sprawling space with myriad studios for creating new things, an economy full of people in the business of creating things. In this new world, most work would be engaging and retiring from such work would be like retiring from life. People need to realize their talents and aspirations. We economists ought to design an economy organized to enable people to have such working lives. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Phelps, for reviewing not only my journeys in economic theory, but also some of the major contributions that you've made to economics and also I think sociocultural theory. I feel like you've um, made some very profound contributions to ways in which uh, Americans can perceive their heritage of innovation. And hopefully this will be a legacy that continues to drive the economy. Um, so I also had the opportunity to work with you on some questions that are directly related to my journeys in economic theory. And um, I think it would be great if we could proceed to discussing those questions. And I'm going to start with number one. So uh, as I had mentioned to you um, in private conversation, uh, I've been a historian since 1994 and historians are oftentimes um, sort of at uh, on the back foot with regard to biographical information, particularly if the subject um, of their inquiry, of their historical narrative um, comes from a controversial background or um, or the context is, um, is difficult. So um, I loved the um, inspired way in which you approached um, your encapsulation of your economic theory through autobiography. And I had been wondering how you came to the decision to write this book as a story, as a narrative. I'm glad you uh, noticed uh, that the, the idea of making a decision uh, was, uh, had to take a deep breath before doing that. Um, <clears throat> 
I, I felt that the storyline uh, of such a book uh, about my professional experiences and my intellectual development would be of considerable interest to, to economists and to some extent maybe to non-economists curious about the life of an economic theorist. Um, regarding the, 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 uh, the, the structure of this, it, it seemed, uh, of that undertaking, it seemed best just to go chronologically. So I think in many respects, it looks like a, 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 a normal uh, diary or whatever it's called. <laughs> Well, I think you've been very successful. It's actually quite a page turner for a book about economic theory. Um, and uh, I think, you know, our, your readership certainly will appreciate all of the biographical, rich, the rich biographical and historical details that you've been able to include by choosing such a structure. So um, my second question was about the way in which you incorporate the everyday realities of ordinary people. Uh, which is also a topic close to my heart. Um, when I did my PhD at Columbia, I focused on including ordinary working people into the history of art. Um, and so much of your economic theory is directed to the everyday realities of social inequality, for example. Um, and I'm wondering if you have found in your experience that American political rhetoric hitting capitalism against socialism has been productive for you and for your colleagues and for the field of economics at large? I find that an easy question to address. Um, I'm sure that many economists would like to see uh, a more sophisticated uh, discussion of both capitalism and socialism uh, in the book and elsewhere. Uh, the fact is uh, real wages have risen alongside real profits in the capitalist economies, especially from the 1920s, uh, even to the uh, present decade. But the case for capitalism appears to be weakened by the nowadays, but by the decline of innovation, which in my uh, estimate uh, began around the early 1970s. There was a bright period of five or six or seven day, years, but then it was back to the same old uh, slow period. Um, but but I think I think the case for capitalism appears to be weakened by the decline of innovation um, that set in around the 1970s. Uh, the, the rise of uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and and and, and uh, more initials after that has occurred in only a small part of the economy and its effects have not been widespread so far. We haven't seen uh, a tremendous rise of wages and productivity and related uh, matters. I would add that the people concerned about wages, in, in particular the relatively low wages these days, ought to press the, con press the Congress to reduce tax rates on wages in the lower echelons and raise taxation of high wage rates and high corporate profits. Well, those seem like very sensible suggestions and ideas. Um, back to the biographical information that you had included in your book. So something that you and I have in common is um, we both lived in Chicago. 
And um, when I lived in Chicago in the early 90s, I was working uh, at the Art Institute of Chicago and there was such a dissonance between my rarefied cultural life at the museum and this neighborhood that I lived in, which was frankly, to be honest with you, a bit terrifying. Um, and, <laughs> um, you know, and, and these conditions persist to this day, I, I feel that Chicago at one point, and this is to your point about perhaps how innovation has slowed since, you know, since the 1970s. At one point, uh, Chicago was a very vibrant city. It was an, an enormously productive city with uh, a railroad system that, that gave it enormous power. Um, and it was really the crossroads of American transportation logistics at one point. Um, so I'm wondering, um, given all of the creativity and cultural production that continues to happen in Chicago, um, you know, with uh, amazing athletes like Michael Jordan, for example, and a whole heritage and legacy of blues and jazz musicians like Howlin' Wolf, um, I'm wondering how this creativity and innovation, how the dynamism of cities like Chicago can be harnessed to benefit the socioeconomic conditions of their residents, many of which are ghettoized minorities with little, little or no access to taxable employment. We think it would be nice to have a well-designed government program that would create new jobs that would attract these minorities and and, and uh, make their situation more more uh, less unpleasant, more more pleasant. Um, it, we just have a, a tremendous distance to go to uh, address the um, the. Um, the um, the plight of of the disadvantaged, but um, I can't help but comment that um, it would be awfully helpful. Helpful. It would be fundamental if we could restore uh, um, dynamism and innovation. That would go a long ways to make jobs better paying and also uh, more interesting. Yeah, I entirely agree. Um, and you know, you might be interested actually to know that um, at the University of Chicago, there is a Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship, which has been doing a lot of great work in the community there on the south side of Chicago. Um, inspiring local residents to become more entrepreneurial and innovative. Um, so perhaps that's something you might be interested in, in looking at. Um, so onward with regard to how governments can incentivize um, citizens and also provide them with the resources they need to fully participate in an innovative and dynamic economy. Um, so in your book, you talk a lot about um, your views on debt and spending, as you would since you're an economist. Um, and you also talk about risk and surplus. Um, and I had, I had um, formulated a question around, uh, around this constellation of ideas, which is I'm wondering how governments can set up the conditions for driving growth through innovation, including the accumulation of enough surplus capital for individuals to confidently invest in risky opportunities, which would include those communities we were just speaking about, the ones who have been excluded from investing in higher risk, higher reward opportunities, and which haven't had access to the necessary resources to become innovative and, and dynamic contributors to the American economy, such as um, a high quality education. Well, 
<clears throat> that's um, quite a wide uh, perspective on the situation. Um, I can only uh, address uh, maybe a small piece of it. Um, regarding economic conditions, I think that to repeat, a revival of widespread innovation in the nation's economy would raise job satisfaction among many affected workers there, as well as help their pocketbooks. How to achieve that revival? My book, Mass Flourishing, and now the memoir I just published, My Journeys in Economic Theory, suggest that our institutions, governments and, and other institutions, ought to widen and deepen the introduction of young people in high schools. At the end of writing Mass Flourishing, I wrote, quote, a modern economy needs people eager to exercise their creativity and venturesome spirit in ever new and challenging environments. It needs people who, when they were young, read the intriguing and uplifting works of the imagination by the likes of, and by no means limited to, Jack London, H. Ryder Haggard, favorite of mine, Jules Verne, Willa Cather, Laura Ingalls Wilder, Arthur Conan Doyle, and an obscure one, H.P. Lovecraft. Um, I went on to add, quote, Without a supportive culture, other steps will not be sufficient. The genius of high dynamism was a restless spirit of conceiving, experimenting, and exploring throughout the economy from the bottom up, leading with insight and luck to innovations. This, grant, this grassroots innovation was driven by the new attitudes and beliefs that defined the modern era. And a full return to high dynamism will require that those modern values prevail again over the traditional ones. Those are my views anyway. Thank you so much. Um, so I question, the next question that I have for you is really about um, some of the methods that you used um, to model your theory. And I'm especially interested in your inclusion of human emotions. Um, we tend to think of economics as a very dry and statistical practice, but um, you have been able to include human emotions like expectation. And um, I'm wondering how you forecast inputs such as the expected rate of inflation. That is to say, how do you quantify human emotions? Um, or would you say that your idea of expectation, for example, how that figures into an economic model is more algebraic? Well, <clears throat> in many situations, I think, um, Economists may be able to understand the action of an individual or a group, a group of people by assuming that these people are acting on the basis of expectations they have formed. That supposition seems completely reasonable to me. It seems like an almost everyday phenomenon. Uh, um, now, it may help to say that an, an, an expectation uh, can't just come from uh, the, the file cabinet. Uh, it, 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 it's, it doesn't come there. It's, it's, it's an assumption. And uh, and um, and and you you have to make assumptions if you want to estimate 
the probability of something. Of course, as you go on and you, you test the validity of your approach, you will, you may see that that assumption was not correct. But I think in, 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 in building a theory and going on to test it, you have to start with, in, 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 um, in social situations, economic situations with, with the uh, exchanges of, of one kind or another, uh, there have to be myriad uh, expectations. And, and the, the, the size of those expectations and the where they are and where they aren't there becomes more evident uh, as as the uh, as the um, statistical work uh, proceeds. And one of the most groundbreaking contributions of yours to the field of economics is the concept of statistical discrimination. Um, and so that was part of uh, the next question, the conversation we were having about that. And I had been wondering um, how re well received your ideas about discrimination had been by other economists. And um, if any other economists had picked up your lead um, and published books or important papers about this idea of statistical discrimination. <clears throat> I wondered about it, about it a little too. Um, um, by coincidence, uh, Kenneth Arrow, very famous uh, economist out of Stanford, uh, produced a paper that was very similar to to uh, my paper. So, in a way, it became a standard uh, hypothesis. Now, how many people went out and tested that hypothesis against real life data? I don't know. Just because I had the fun of conceiving a new idea doesn't mean that I spent days and nights looking for people to, <laughs> to, to test it. Uh, I, I don't do testing. Um, um, and I, I, I don't actually spend a lot of time uh, reading uh, uh, statistical work. For my, it's my my loss. But you have to you have to find where your strengths are and and where your interests will will uh, will, will flourish. Right. And um, I mean, so one of the sort of points of comparison that I was making while reading your work um, and thinking about other works of economic theory or indeed economic history that I had read um, was the sort of statistical way of thinking versus what you had done, which is really hu a humanistic view of economics. You not only include everyday people in your thinking and human emotion in your modeling. Um, but also um, you pay attention to, you know, a lot of the um, sort of everyday lived realities and, and things that are important to, to regular people like wages. Um, and, and I found this to be very compelling, not just the biographical information and the story, the narrative that you that you produced, but also, um, you know, the very humanistic approach that you had. I really appreciated that. Um, and so I had been thinking also about your friendship with John Rawls, um, who was a very famous political philosopher, um, also had been um, inspiring some of your ideas on altruism. Um, and I was wondering, um, given, you know, Rawls's and your um, historical context and background, 
um, if any of the ideas that um, or experiences that might have occurred during the Great Depression for either of you, I know that you were very young at the time, if this had sort of influenced or affected either or both of your um, ways of thinking about your different disciplines. I've always thought that it, it didn't really, but, it, but it, it, it occurs to me now that I could be wrong about that. Maybe it did have an influence on me and I just didn't notice it. Um, I mean, I didn't, I didn't notice what was happening to me. I, I was only a certain sensibility or a certain, certain impressions and certain interests did grow up in my mind, but um, I suppose, but it, where they come from is, is, is not uh, very clear to me. My my parents, my father would sometimes come back um, from from work um, in New York, and uh, sometimes he would talk about um, what's going on in the in the in the company. But um, <clears throat> and my parents might have made comments once in a while about the Democrats and the Republicans, and, and um, they were Democrats. Um, so am I, uh, but, um, I, I don't, I don't know how much, how much of my interest in economics derived from, um, the lives of my mother and father. Um, um. But I know, I do know that um, my interest in the less advantaged was sparked by John Rawls. There's no question about that. And that was a um, lifelong um, uh, relationship of, of mine, a lifelong friendship. Um, and um, only rather recently, I discovered that uh, by by a, a by a, a Rawls uh, specialist that um, in his um, <clears throat> in his uh, data in 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 his in his in his, uh, in his uh, Uh, his, uh, what is known about what he read. Um, he, um, I, I, I'm, I was easily the most read economist of John Rawls. <laughs> so there was a little bit of reciprocity there. Sorry, that's to say you haven't just read deeply into John Rawls, but you've read very broadly uh, and deeply into such a wide variety of disciplines. And you describe in, in your journeys that um, you had made friends with, with a, a very wide variety of philosophers, artists, um, and some very famous literary personalities. Um, and it was really quite fascinating to read. So it sort of gave you uh, a sense of not just you know, all of the um, wonderful experiences you've had throughout your life and all of the friends and acquaintances that you had made, but it also kind of gave me a slice of what New York might have been like, um, you know, when you were having all of these experiences. Um, and it seemed like, you know, you were having just an absolutely wonderful time. So we're almost out of time here. And I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind, we could skip to the last question which is um, we had been discussing some of the big issues facing society these days. Um, and I think specifically we had thought about climate change. Um, but this last question is how can we harness 
the uh, indigenous innovation and dynamism of American society to address some of the big challenges that are facing all of us, you, you know, even globally, if we think about climate change. Well, um, at the risk of, of repeating a little bit of what I said before, um, I'd, I'd like to say that um, three or maybe somewhat more Western nations were doing very well in generating innovation. And, and, and uh, there was, uh, there seemed to be for a long time, happy societies resulting. Uh, that was France until the end of the twenties and America until the end of the sixties and Britain until 1900 or so. But what I believe happened was a, a decline of, of dynamism in the people, perhaps a loss of vitalism or a loss of the desire for self-expression, for creating, exploring, voyaging into the unknown. As I said to Rana Waruhar in a long conversation about America and its slowdown, um, it's not the nation that Norman Rockwell painted and Willer Cather wrote about. It's, as Rana said in a, in a capsule way, it's about values. We're not going to get anywhere until we address those values. Thank you so much, Professor Phelps. I think this is a great note to close on. Um, perhaps Cambies has a couple of words he would like to say. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Becker. Thanks so much, Professor Phelps. Uh, it has been very enlightening. Uh, I just want to let our audience know that this is uh, this has been recorded and uh, we will share the link of this recording within the 24 hours from now. And uh, we also will send with the link to the recording, the link to the book and uh, a Columbia only discount code. So be, be on the lookout for that. So without further any comment, thank you so much and uh, uh, looking forward to uh, uh, another engagement like this. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you.